the king of the water is back. What? Nat Geo Shark Fest is celebrating 10 years yeah. with four weeks. Doesn't get much better than this. 27 new premieres yeah. and more platforms than ever before. We know sharks. Hey. We know experts. This should give us some really good data. Whoa. We know you can't get enough. Shark Fest starts Sunday, July 10th at 10. On Nat Geo and Disney Plus. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. When you answer the phone, do you have a favorite word or phrase that's a little bit out of the ordinary? Or maybe you know somebody who does that? We asked readers of our email newsletter that question, and they had some surprising responses. We heard from Matt on Nantucket Island, Massachusetts, who told us that when he picks up the phone, he says, front desk. (laughs) (laughs) He says he does that in an attempt to stop the caller's brain, if only for a nanosecond, and adds, it often works. We heard from Ann Lynn in Ithaca, New York, who wrote that her grandfather, who was born in the late 1800s and lived in Ontario, Canada, used to pick up the phone and say, commence. (laughs) Just commence. (laughs) Yeah. And then for Marlene Dryden, this question brought back memories of her great aunt Eula McQuage of Salisbury, North Carolina. She says, Miss Eula would hear her phone ring from a little alcove in the wall of her foyer, and she'd slowly walk over there, pick it up calmly, and holler, All right? All right. (laughs) (laughs) That's fantastic. Isn't that great? She says, That beautiful, nearly tidewater accent and the smell of cornbread are the most vivid memories I have of her. And... I mean, I wonder if that's a vestige of, you know, when you had operators plugging in the cords. Right, right. When you did need to make sure that the line was okay before you began your conversation. Uh Uh-huh. We would love to hear more about how you answer the phone. What do you say? Is it funny? Is it old-fashioned? Is it something cool or weird? 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. And the lines are open to talk about anything related to language. You can talk to us on Twitter, too, at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hello, uh, this is Mary Ann. I'm calling from Valdosta, Georgia. Hi, Mary Ann. Hi. Welcome to the show. Yeah, what would you like to talk with us about? Well, I want to know the proper way to pronounce the word spelled B-O-N-A-F-I-D-E-S. I'm not sure... If the B-O-N is pronounced bone or bon, and I'm not sure if the F-I-D-E-S is pronounced fides, fides, or one syllable fides. Oh, boy. Marianne, where have you run across this expression spelled B-O-N-A-F-I-D-E-S? I read every night before I go to sleep, and I ran across it in a, bur- in a book, and it's one of those words that I have no trouble reading. But if I try to say it, it it sticks in my throat because no way I tried to pronounce it sounded correct. And I looked it up um, and listened to several pronunciations, and I got even more confused because there seemed to be multiple so-called acceptable ways to pronounce this term. And I thought, I have to take a stand on this, kind of like, when you take a stand on which way you're going to put the toilet paper on the toilet paper holder, either over or under, I over. had to find out the best way to pronounce it. So I'm prevailing upon you to solve this for me. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, the answer is over, right? Over. For the toilet paper? Of course. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> And this term means something like authentic credentials, right? Isn't that the sense that you have when you're reading and you come across yes. this expression? Authentic yes, credentials. Yes, exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell you, Marianne, I have always pronounced it bona fides, bona fides. But, you know, mm. there are some authorities who have sneered at that pronunciation, and they say it should be <laughs> bona fides. 
But anyway, bona fides and bona fides are usually the pronunciations heard in the United States. It was borrowed intact from Latin, and it's spelled the same way, B-O-N-A, and then a separate word, F-I-D-E-S. And in Latin, you pronounce it bona fides, and that literally means good faith. So the fides means faith. It's like our word fidelity. And the bona means good. It's like our word bonus. So bona fides in Latin, and somebody who's trying to show off that they've had a little Latin may say bona fides. But, you know, that's pretentious. I mean, we're speaking English and not Latin. And if we're going to be that strict about um, pronouncing words from Latin, then we shouldn't be talking about quoting somebody verbatim, because in Latin it's where bottom. And uh, we shouldn't be talking about things ad infinitum, because in Latin it would be ad infinitum. And Marianne, the other thing that complicates this is the fact that the fides in Latin, bona fides, is actually one of those rare Latin nouns that end in s, but they're actually singular. There are not that many of those. That means that when this term was adopted whole into English uh, in the 17th century, people might say something like, that person's bona fides is impeccable. That meaning their their good faith or their sincerity is impeccable. And it was only later that people started saying that person's bona fides or that person's bona fides are impeccable. So I come down on the side of just saying, <laughs> find a different word, credentials, good faith, sincerity, yes. something like that. Well, I like that recommendation. That simplifies my life tremendously. However, I am going to practice saying bona fides. So if I am forced to say it in a conversation, I will know with certainty the way I'm supposed to pronounce it. And I like the clean contemporary sound of bona fides instead of the Latin, which, as you say, sounds a little pretentious. Exactly. So bona fides or bona fides. Or, as you suggested earlier, uh, don't avoid using it and say something like good faith <laughs> or credibility or credentials right. or authenticity. Right. I like that. Bye, Marianne. Take care. Be well. Thank Bye-bye. you, Marianne. Take care. So much. Thank Bye-bye. you. 877 929 9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or let's chat on Twitter at W A Y W O R D. Grant, you remember our conversation about pigeon pairs. Those aren't birds, they're people. Right. That's when a family has both a boy and a girl, and no more, no less. Right. That conversation prompted a response from Jessie Ravage, who lives in Cooperstown, New York. And she writes, My mother was told when my brother was born that now she had a millionaire's family. She figured it was because there would be no handing down of clothes from Jesse to her brother. You know, it was really expensive to have two kids like that. But it sounds like it's more like an ideal. Um, I found lots of instances of the term millionaire's family or million dollar family, which is also one boy and one girl. Or some people refer to two million dollar families, which are two boys and two girls. Oh, <laughs> and so the, <laughs> the, the idea is just that, just like the pigeon pair is sometimes called the royal pair mm-hmm. or the king's pair, it's just the idea that this is just what you would really want if you are <laughs> right. a, a, a great family, just uh, <laughs> right. one to marry off uh, and one to take over. And right. You can pick which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, supposedly the ideal, but of course, families come in all different shapes and sizes. Yes, they do. And tell us about your family and the language you use. You can tell us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Nathan from San Antonio. Hey, Nathan, welcome. Yeah, so I have a question for you all about a word that I heard all the time growing up, and the word is crisp. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about when I would hear it. So I grew up in Chicago, and my parents would often take us on road trips down to Florida to go to, like, Disney World or something like that. And we'd get up really early in the morning to leave at about like 4 a.m. And so everyone would be really tired and cranky. And they would use the word crisp to basically mean that. So, for example, if I was bothering my sister, my parents might say, you know, Nathan, leave her alone. She's really crisp. Or if I snipped at my parents, I would say, oh, I'm sorry. I was just being crisp. And 
I've used this word many times since then, and no one knows what I'm talking about. And when I asked my parents about it, they said that they heard it growing up, but all my friends in Chicago haven't heard of it. And I've tried to look it up and I just don't know where it's coming from or if this is a real thing or just a family thing. And Nathan, you're spelling it C-R-I-S-P? Crisp? That's right. Crisp. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think we can help you with this. So just to to recap here, it's early in the morning. Everyone's gotten up at 4 a.m. and you and your sister are just not morning people. You are still tired and cranky and just not with it right yeah and my brother so it would be a a big fight yeah so there's three (laughs) little monsters that your parents are having to keep 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 together and you're all crisp (laughs) i think it might make your parents crisp (laughs) yeah parents are probably crisp too but you know they they've got to suffer through it that's parenthood (laughs) uh we can probably help you with this i think this is probably a form of a crisp adjective that i know that is in Green's Dictionary of Slang. Jonathan Green has put this together, and he takes this back to the late 70s. And the definition that he has is a suffering from an excess of drugs, drink, fast living, and stress. And obviously, uh, that doesn't fully apply to three children on their way to Disney World. But um, I think the suffering from an excess and the stress part do, because we're talking about somebody that is burned out. And that's what crisp is. It's literally a synonym for other slang expressions like fried or baked or burned out, where you are just exhausted. You have nothing left in the tank. There's no energy to spare. Huh, cool. Yeah, that absolutely sounds about right. Is there any, like, regional thing to it? Like, you know what I mean? Or... Um, Some of the earliest uses come up from slang collected on college campuses. So it's not regional, but it might be what's called age graded, where it started with young people. And I don't know how old your parents are, but if they were in college in, say, the mid to late 70s, perhaps that's where they learned it. Yeah, that totally checks out. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely. And I can't wait to tell my folks. Um <laughs> Yeah, that they didn't just make it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not that's just good. your family. <laughs> Not just your family. Yeah. Well, Nathan, thanks for calling. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Martha and Grant. Y'all are great. I love the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, Thank of course. You. Call again sometime. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 877 In parts of the southern United States, if you really like the food you're eating, you can say so with your feet. Specifically, you say something like, I could eat this with my toe in the fire, or I could eat this with one foot in the milk bucket. Oh, how about that? I don't think I knew that. Um, You know, suggesting that the food is so delicious that you can ignore the circumstances. Uh, You could also... Do it with your feet by walking up to the counter and putting in another order. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll have some more of that fried catfish, please. <laughs> That's right. Burn a few calories between the chair and the, <laughs> and the counter. Hit us up, words at waywardradio.org. More about what you say and why you say it. Stick around for more of Away With Words. The King of the Water is back. What? Nat Geo Shark Fest is celebrating 10 years yeah. with four weeks. Doesn't get much better than this. 27 new premieres yeah. and more platforms than ever before. We know sharks. Hey. We know experts. This should give us some really good data. Whoa. We know you can't get enough. Shark, 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 shark. starts Sunday, July 10th at 10. On Nat Geo and Disney Plus. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett, and we're joined by, who is this guy? It's John Chinesky. What? Haven't seen you in a whole week, and you look very different, John. John Chinesky, our quiz guy. Thank you. I did shave. I had a beard. I had a beard last <laughs> week, and I shaved. I don't know how you picked that up. In any case, let's move on to this puzzle here, this quiz I have for you. You know, very often, creativity is born out of love. 
For example, many performers, actors, singers, and uh, works of fiction, TV shows, movies, have such a dedicated fan base that the group adopts a unique name to identify them to each other and the outside world. Now, one of the most famous, of course, is Trekkies, to refer to fans of the Star Trek TV and movie franchise. And perhaps you know that fans of the singer Justin Bieber are called... Bieber, be- Beliebers? Beliebers, oh, yeah, Beliebers, right, exactly. So we're going to take a trip through some hardcore fandoms, and let's see if you can answer these questions about the fans of different performers or things, okay? Yeah, oh, yeah. All right. Good, good. Now, you might know that fans of Taylor Swift use what name? It sounds as if they might be fans of funny adverbs, Tom said vocally. Uh, Swifties. <laughs> Swifties, yes, exactly. They are Swifties. Now, these two are similar and simple. He writes the songs like Copacabana and Could It Be Magic, but his followers just change the first letter of his last name and pluralize it to get their fandom. What are they? Menelos? Right, but they change the first letter to get... Fanalos. Fanalos, (laughs) yes. I thought you meant plural of man. Oh, like Menelos, no. No, Fanalos, yeah. Actors, too, have fandoms. Actor Chris Pine has a devoted following. It may be a simply constructed fandom name, but I like how it reminds me of delicious seeds used to make pesto. Pine nuts. Pine nuts, Pine nuts. <laughs> yes. Pretty simple. Similarly, what longtime talk show host's followers call themselves coconuts? Oh, um... What's his yeah. face? Red hair, tall, Irish. That's his face. <laughs> yeah. Conan O'Brien fans. Conan O'Brien, that's right. Of course, fans of Jimmy Buffett are parrot heads, and fans of the Grateful Dead are deadheads. If you make a fist, you might figure out the fandom name for fans of the band Five Finger Death Punch. Fist heads? Uh, punch heads? No, when you make a fist, what do you uh, highlight on your hand? You make a fist, you highlight knuckleheads. Knuckleheads. Knuckleheads, (laughs) yes, for five-finger death punch. I like that one. Finally, he does things differently and funnily, so not surprisingly, what comedians' fandom call themselves, or were likely dubbed by the man himself, close personal friends of Al. Weirdos? (laughs) No, no, no. This, that's the actual oh. name of the fandom is Close oh. <laughs> Personal Friends of Al. <laughs> but I think you know the person. Who is it? Uh, it's Weird Al Yankovic. Then. It is Weird Al Yankovic. Yeah, it's one of my favorite fandom names. Close Personal Friends of Al. <laughs> <laughs> so perfect. <laughs> well, listen, I'm a fan of you two guys, and I think you did a great job on that puzzle. Thanks so much. Oh, Thanks, thank John. Thank you, John. Well, we'll talk to you next week. Talk to you then. This show does puzzles, and we'd like to talk to you about the puzzles you have over language. What's the question you've been asking yourself? Where did that come from? Why does it mean that? What's the real answer? Well, we'd like to help you sort it out. 877-929-9673. Words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, I'm Carolyn Vargo from Milwaukee. And I just wanted to tell you about uh, my grandchildren and um, some ways they like to tease their grandpa and their grandpa likes to tease them what they do is they do all kinds of teasing but I've given them some ammunition and one of the things I gave them was uh, were some gestures that they can use uh, with the um, with grandpa they come from a book called Beau Geste um, a guide to French body language by Lawrence Wiley and Rick Stafford one of the gestures that is most useful to them is called mon oeil, which means my eye in French. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it means my eye, you can't fool me. And they point to their, their finger to their eye, and that's their way of saying grandpa, I, really. <laughs> right. They express this doubt and, or, or even a refusal to acknowledge anything that he said. <laughs> And uh, often you'll see the French people, they'll pull down the lower eyelid so that the socket is exposed uh-huh. and go, Monoy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the most useful one that they've got. Um, there are other, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how much you want to know about the other gestures that are in the book. Um, Let's hear one more. Um, yeah, give us another one. Uh, okay. So um, if, if you 
uh, do marmo, which means silly or funny, uh, and you act like a monkey. That's an, that's another one that they can use, and it just means you think you're really funny, Grandpa. <laughs> oh, but you're not, huh? <laughs> and these are all from this book. And do you have any French heritage, or just you just found it amusing, no. so you decided to use it? No, I just I took French in in college, and so okay. uh, that's where I I got this book. And um, they're just uh, and and as I you know traveled to France and things, I saw a lot of really interesting conversations going on in the subways and stuff, but those you wouldn't teach to your grandchildren, but mm. they had, uh, <laughs> they would, true. Same you know, two people would be <laughs> signaling to each other across the tracks and that kind of thing. But, um, yeah. And, and so this book is really helpful. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful because there's some, there's some things that, uh, if you're not part of the culture, you might not get, um, yeah context is everything so you have to be careful thank you Mm -hmm. so much for sharing that with us and your story about amusing your your grandkids and your father with this book and call us again sometime all right thank you thank you it's a pleasure share your stories and experiences about language 877-929-9673 or send them to us an email the address is words at waywardradio.org We talked not long ago about the word ort, O-R-T, meaning a small bite of food that's left on one's dinner plate. And some people learn that word when they're reading Virginia Woolf or D.H. Lawrence. And other people pick it up when they're doing crossword puzzles because it's such a handy word. But apparently, a lot of people learn this word at summer camp. We heard from Linda Hahn of New York City, who wrote to say that the first time she heard the word ort was when she chaperoned her daughter's sixth grade class to a sleepaway camp in the Poconos. And at the end of the camper's first meal there, the camp counselors pointed out some buckets at the end of the dining hall, and they called these the ort buckets. And they told the kids to scrape all the excess food off their plates into those buckets and then go back to their seats. Those scraps of food almost filled one of the buckets, and that's when the counselors told them that the ort buckets should remind them to be mindful of food waste. And they challenged the kids to make sure that by the end of the week, those ort buckets were empty. And sure enough, it worked. And Linda says, I wonder if these camp people go to some kind of group meetings to figure out new strategies to engage preteens at these camps. Someone was like, Hey, how about we focus on food waste this year? And some word nerd at the table says, I know, we'll call it the Ort Report. (laughs) And Grant, apparently this was a thing because we heard from another listener about daily Ort Reports at a camp in New England. So I'm figuring that maybe a lot of English majors were working summer jobs up there in the the mountains. And summer camps have been a thing for a very long time. So they've had an incredible amount of... Uh, experience at putting together all these different opportunities to teach and make it more than about you know, hikes and canoeing. Mm-hmm. By the way, I was telling my son about our conversation about orts, and he said, oh, isn't that a baby orc? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they're just born, they're called ortlets. <laughs> ortlets, little ort. <laughs> Call us up, 877-929-9673. Welcome to Away With Words. Hi, Martha. This is uh, Stephen from East Aurora, New York. Hey, Stephen. So I was inquiring about the word Dutchman. I'm a furniture maker, and I've come across it when I was working in uh, New England and worked for a a relatively high-end maker making bespoke furniture. And uh, what what, I mean, essentially what it is is a patch. But my understanding of a Dutchman is that it is a it's a patch of a much higher level uh, than just a, you know just sort of a spackle it over kind of thing. Where it would come about would be uh, we would be uh, you know shaping the edging on a table, and you would do your best to select very clear stock, but inevitably as you profile down into something, you'd find like a little what's called cat's paw or a little mineral streak or something like that, which 
which didn't look good, so you had to make a little Dutchman. So you would square out the joint and then let in a piece of solid stock that was much cleaner or didn't have this a defect in it, and that was called a Dutchman. And my, you know, <laughs> limited Googling on it has has sort of led me to that it was its work of a of a lesser quality, and that's not what I understand it to me. But I guess I sort of wondered from whence you know comes the etymology or the or the origin of it. You know why why a Dutchman? Oh wow! Yeah, thank you for the backstory on how you use that because that word really has gone through some changes since it first pops up in English of at least 150 years ago. Uh, so you use Dutchman in woodworking, and it's not really a mistake, is it? You're you're patching an imperfection perfectly so that people can't tell. Right. I mean, you match the grain and the color and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, everything else. I mean, certainly it has been used, <laughs> you know, when you, like, when yeah. you botch a job or nick an edge or something like that. It's like, okay, then you... And it is also a Dutchman, obviously. There's a lot more to say on this because folklorists and researchers have looked into this. As a matter of fact, Archie Green was one researcher who wrote about this in the 1960s in the Journal of American Speech. And he talked to woodworkers uh, all over the country at the time about this. And the overall point that he makes about Dutchman is that it's one of a very large set of slangy terms used in blue-collar physical labor professions that refer to ethnic or national origin. And they can be negative or positive or neutral, but they all reflect this integration of immigrants into the workplace and the friction that that can generate. And so sometimes mm -hmm. it comes out as humor or sometimes dark humor, bittersweet humor, but it comes out in these, in these little terms like Dutchman. And so there are all these terms, and sometimes they're outside the workplace, so that represent these uh, nations and ethnicities on the world stage, and they show up in these little ways. In this case, Archie Green thinks it has to do with the huge number of German immigrants who came to the U.S. during the mm. 1800s, many of them bringing this prized woodworking skill. And as you may know, the German Deutsch, Deutsch means German in German, was often termed as Dutch in English. And so people, it's possible the Dutchman just refers to this very careful way of fixing or replacing uh, an imperfection in a, bit, in a bit of wood in the, in the very skilled way that a German would do it. You know, if they were the workers of the highest uh, caliber and if that's what they brought to it. That's his theory. It's about solving your problems and finding a good outcome, even in the face of a less than ideal situation. A Dutchman is about solving a problem. And what's interesting is the older uses of Dutchman were about uh, just even fillers or space holders, not necessarily a perfect one and not necessarily to fix a mistake. It might just be the wood's a little uneven, so you have to plane it some. or um, And that could be a, a Dutchman or um, you smooth out a hollow. And it was used in typesetting, masonry, metalwork, shipbuilding, theater in order to make two sets match um, they would use a Dutchman of canvas or cloth. Um, all of these different fields use the term Dutchman in a lot of uh, different ways. In typesetting, they would take toothpicks and wedge the lead type to get it exactly where they wanted, and that was a Dutchman. Interesting to see what trade it was sort of the birth of it, but I suppose I, I, we'll never know. Well, I do believe that it was from shipbuilding. Uh, that's that's the earliest uses that we find. Okay. Okay. Well, Steve, thanks so much for sharing some of your own work with us. It's, it sounds like a fascinating, uh, fascinating thing you do. Oh, well, thank you so much. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bring us your words and phrases from your work or from your hobbies. We'd love to hear about them. 877-929-9673 or email us words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Madeline from the Manistee National Forest. Now, where is that? Well, if you look at the back of your left hand at the base of your little fingernail on the shores of Lake Michigan. What can we do for you today? Well, I have a question about a word. Uh, you know, in the 1930s, we were wearing overalls, denim overalls. In the 1940s, we wore dungarees. 1950s, we wore Levi's. In the 1960s, I wore blue jeans. In the 1970s, I was wearing bell bottoms. Now we have jeans or flares. And the question I have is the word dungarees. 
I had associated it with either the ocean or the barn, and I didn't know whether that was correct or not. <laughs> with the barn? Yep, the dung part of it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wearing those to muck out the stalls, huh? Right, right. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, it doesn't have to do with uh, oceans or barns, really. Well, maybe oceans a little bit, since it has to do with the export of fabric uh, from India. It, the term dungarees is actually a relic of the British colonial presence in India. And dungaree was the name of a kind of cotton cloth that was exported from India to England in the 1600s. And it came from this place... Um, that in the Marathi language, and that's a language of West Central India, um, sounds sort of like Dongari Kila. It means hill fort. And it was this, um, this fortification in a port near what is now Mumbai. And this dungaree fabric that was produced there was originally used to, to make sails and tents, but it was adapted for sturdy work clothes. And so dungarees became the word for trousers made from this material that was produced in that village. And then since the late 16th century, the English were importing another kind of fabric, a cotton twill from another port city, that is the Italian port city of Genoa. And this fabric from Genoa eventually became known as jean, jean fabric. In the same way that uh, the dungaree fabric was used to make dungarees, um, trousers mm-hmm. made from this uh, fabric eventually called jean from Genoa were called jeans. And the list goes on. You asked about Levi's. I, I imagine you know yeah. that one. Yeah. And, you know, during the, the war in the 1940s, I was a three-year-old running around San Diego and that's when uh, I first heard dungarees, and we used it for a while, and uh, then it changed through the years. <laughs> mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting, too, because in the U.K., the term dungarees uh, now refers to what we in this country call bib overalls, your dungarees. Yeah, that's right. I was just puzzled because, you know, I, my dad was in the Navy, and that was why I associated it with the mariners, but that's wrong. It comes from India. It so does I appreciate indeed. finding it out. I've been wondering about it for some time. And thank you so much. I sure enjoy your show. Madeline, thank you so much for your for your call. We really appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. Take care now. Take care. There are puzzles in everyday life, whether you put them on your body or put them in your mouth. There's a story behind every word. 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org. In parts of Appalachia, if you want to describe coffee that's really weak, you can describe it as scared water. I love that. (laughs) Scared water. Don't give me any of that scared water. (laughs) (laughs) I like that a whole bunch. I do too. 877-929-9673. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. If you're reading a book with an index, you probably take that index for granted. But it turns out that indexes and their history are far more interesting than you might think. And their story is told in a delightfully nerdy new book by Dennis Duncan. It's called, appropriately enough, Index, A History of The. And it turns out that the history of the index is really about the history of writing and the history of books themselves. Even in antiquity, Plato worried that the new technology of the time, that is writing and reading, was going to make people stupid because they'd stop memorizing things and they'd be dependent on the written word. And even in the Middle Ages, as scribes started using indexes, these new contrivances were not entirely welcome, surprisingly enough. Indexes provoke similar concerns. People worried, well, if a book has an index, why would anybody actually read a book? And in the early 18th century, Jonathan Swift worried that people would pretend to understand a book, quote, by scouting through the index, as if a traveler should go about to describe a palace when he has seen nothing but the privy. 
And it's also a hearty appreciation of professional indexers. In fact, the author gives a shout out specifically to Paula Clark Bain, who is the professional who wrote an index to this book. And she shows how authorial and even playful a good indexer can be. He also includes a computer generated index. And it's just not as good. It's just not as interesting. It's, it's not as alive as the one that Paula Clark Bain produced. I looked at that computer index and I agree. It was uh, it was fine. I could use it, uh, but it wasn't it was lifeless. Hmm. It, it didn't um, it didn't have the the extra knowledge, the pragmatics that a human would bring to the job, understanding that A was a part of B and that you should include it as a, you know, a sub index item, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and computerized stuff just isn't quite there yet for that. The other thing I was thinking as I browsed this book and I didn't read it, nor did I just, <laughs> nor did I do what is called a, a Washington read. Do you remember what that term is? It's when you take a book, you look for your name in the index, and if oh, you don't yeah. find it, you put it back. <laughs> right, right. There's a famous story about William F. Buckley sending a copy of his latest book to Norman Mailer, and, and in the index where Norman Mailer's name is listed, Buckley wrote, Hi! <laughs> <laughs> Well, that book, again, is called Index, A History of Thee, and it's by Dennis Duncan. I'm looking forward to finishing the book. We'd love to hear about what you're reading. We are so delighted, and our bedside tables are stacked with the books that you send us (laughs) and the books that you recommend. 877-929-9673. And send your recommendations to us in email, words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hey, this is Andrew from Lexington, South Carolina. Hey, Andrew. Welcome. Hi, Andrew. What's up? So I guess I'll just jump right into it. My question would be, or, you know, just growing up, my mom and my grandma used to both say to me, like, whenever I wanted to put something in the microwave or reheat something, they would always say, you know, just nuke it or, oh, just nuke it in the microwave. And I just kind of wanted to know, you know, where that word came from and, you know, how it relates to microwaving something. Okay. So when would this be? What, What decade are we talking? Uh, I was born in the late 90s, so I would say, you know, early 2000s is mostly when I would hear it. The the first place that we have print records and print versus spoken, because obviously we can't track what people say, but if they write it down, we can match the words to dates. And that first match that we have is from the Daily Tar Heel, which is a student newspaper of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1982 of students, this long, jokey piece about students nuking food in, in co- on a college campus, talking about melting things in the microwave, um, which is really interesting because if obviously nuking things and nuclear weapons is is terrible. And, and you know, this we're talking about going from the idea of nuclear bombs and nuclear weapons to microwaving food. It's just a it's a really big leap. Right. But there there is a path there. There's a path. Yeah. And and part of it has to do with how we got from the word nuclear to the word nuke in UKE. And it happened almost immediately, you know, after the nuclear weapons of were used during World War II by the United States on Japan. Uh, the idea of nuclear weapons was pervasive throughout the Western world. And by the late 50s, nuke as a shorthand for weapons themselves was common in the popular press. And, and in the military in the 1960s, nuke could be used to mean a nuclear-powered sea craft, like a submarine, or a sailor that was assigned to such a ship. And in the public sphere, nuke was used as a shorthand for a nuclear power station. So there's this period in the 1960s where you could see a protest where people would be chanting, no nukes. And you might not know whether or not they were talking about no nuclear power stations or no nuclear weapons, because they could be protesting against either or both, I guess. Pretty interesting. But also at the same time that verb to nuke was growing and um, the obvious use of to attack with nuclear weapons was there. But even almost immediately, it starts to be used hyperbolically, which is the, the great American way with language where we exaggerate or understate to just a ridiculous level. And we used it almost immediately to mean to punish or destroy, to ruin. There's one quote from the early 1960s talking about getting revenge on a fellow Air Force cadet. Uh, is isn't called nuking them. And this is called uh, semantic 
bleaching, uh, which is a kind of amelioration where something goes from really negative to, to fairly positive. Wow, that is that's really cool. Yeah, and then it just it just kept going from there until we get to the idea where you can nuke your nachos to warm them up. <laughs> of course, the main problem okay. with this is there's no there's nothing nuclear about a microwave. It's it's radio waves in there. Right, that's that's what I thought as well. So I I didn't see the the connection before, but it's starting to make sense now. Yeah, when the when the microwaves popped up in the mid 1970s, I think it was even though the name of how the food is cooked is is right there. The, the machine is called by the method. <laughs> um, I think it was and maybe still is mysterious to people. I mean, you can see through the little window the food bubbling, and the food is hot when you take it out, but the device itself is cool. It's kind of like magic. So I think in people's minds, you know, this mysteriousness of nuclear power and nuclear weapons and the mysteriousness of microwaves just kind of went hand in hand. They just just a weird, mysterious technology to people. So amelioration. Yeah, that's that's what happened with that one. Mm -hmm. Something terrible becomes something mundane. Yeah. Well, now I know. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, you're welcome, Andrew. Call us again sometime. All right. All righty. Sounds good. Y'all have a good day. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Take care. 877-929-9673. We continue to gather more terms from around the world to denote somebody who's stingy, the person who never picks up the check in the restaurant. And Rick from San Antonio sent us two expressions that he learned in Brazil. One is mal de vaca, and the other is pau duro. And mal de vaca literally means the hand of the cow. So if you have a cow's hand, you are literally tight-fisted. <laughs> you and... have no fingers to pick things up. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely no opposable thumb. And then pau duro is hard bread, and that's somebody who is so miserly that they hoard their bread, nibbling at it for so long that it just gets rock hard. So hand of the cow and hard bread. Lovely. 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, Grant. This is uh, Brendan Martin here. How are you doing? All right. Where are you calling from, Brendan? I'm calling from Lewis, Delaware. Lewis, Delaware. Well, welcome to the show. So I am a uh, recent graduate of Northern Arizona University, and with this freshly minted degree, you know, I decided to um, get into the job market. So as such, I've been going on a lot of interviews, um, mm -hmm. applying for a lot of positions, and I noticed that a lot of these interviews, they kind of, you know, in the corporate world, they, they kind of are handled in a similar fashion. So a lot of the same questions, a lot of the same answers, um, you know, one of which being you know, they kind of want to gauge the individual's ambition and sort of like um, their lack of complacency, if you will. So one of the questions that they always ask is, you know, where do you see yourself in a few years? Or, you know, tell us about something that motivates you. Uh, to which, you know, I usually respond something like, you know, I'm very concerned with career trajectory or, you know, upward mobility. Or um, a phrase I've been using was a path to ascension. So for each of these interviews, I usually prepare a little script, kind of like a dossier that I can reference while I'm on the phone. Um, so I was writing down Path to Ascension the other day, uh, and, you know, I spelled it correctly, or so I thought, and it occurred to me that Ascension was spelled differently than it sounded. To me, you know, I was like, why is it not T-I-O-N, and why is it spelled S-I-O-N? And I thought to myself, who better than to answer such a question than my friends from the West Coast. So by path to ascension, you mean advancing your career by moving up the ladder? Or advancing yeah, to you... godhood, maybe. <laughs> no, no. Um, well, you know, while I do aspire to do both at some point, um, right now I'm kind of... <laughs> I'm more or less focused on my career, you know? Okay. Yeah, the reason that Grant and I are scratching our heads a little bit is that um, when the word ascension came into English, uh, it specifically referred to the ascension of Christ, you know, the story of Christ going up from earth into heaven um, uh -huh. on the 40th day after the resurrection. And the reason that it has that S is that it comes from Latin ascensionem, which means a going up. It's, it's related to words like ascend. 
And it first appears, as I said, in English in the 14th century, and it was borrowed into English directly from Latin in that religious sense. And so today you'll still hear people talking about the ascension of Christ, or maybe if they're talking about royalty, um, an earthly monarch, they might talk about that person's ascension to the throne. But I'm not sure it's used so much in a career sense. And it sounded like you were also interested in not just the appropriateness for a job hunt, but also why S-I-O-N versus T-I-O-N at the end. Yeah, yeah. No, that was that was the initial, um, I wouldn't say concern, but that was the initial thing that piqued my interest. Well, yeah, as I said, it was borrowed directly into English from the Latin, ascensionem. More often today, the word that replaces it is the word ascent. And you may wonder why the word ascent has that T in it rather than rather than an S, and that's because it showed up in the 1600s, and it was formed by analogy with another word that had already been floating around for 300 years, which was descent. And the reason that that word has the T is that it didn't come directly from Latin into English. It passed through Old French, where descent uh, meant uh, uh, your genealogical lineage, you know, what you descended from. So that's why those have those T's. But uh, in terms of ascension uh, rather than ascension, um, that's because it was borrowed whole from the Latin word that did have an S in it. Gotcha. So descent is just a little more well-traveled in its path to current usage. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want that for your career, for sure. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Advancement mm-hmm. might be the better word there. Mm. It will be. Okay, cool. Advancement. Yeah. So this is going This is going in the script now. It's going on the dock yeah. Well, good luck, Brendan, in the new job, and congratulations. That's a, a big moment in anyone's life. Hey, thanks Thanks a lot. I, You know, I appreciate you taking the time out to uh, hear, uh, to take the call. You know, and I've been a long-time listener. You guys are the greatest, and... um you know, can't wait to hear what else you guys come up with. Same goes for you, too. Kick you butt. sound Thank like you somebody much. to watch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, um, well, you know, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, All Brendan. Right, thanks, yep, All right. Thanks, Yeah. See ya. Uh, we'd love to hear the language that you're using uh, at your workplace, whether you're new or been there 40 years. Uh, what are the little dilemmas that you have about putting something together, or whether it's a presentation for the whole company or just something that you put together for yourself? Uh You have these little questions, and we have answers, and hey, let's talk about it. 877-929-9673, or email words at waywardradio.org. Hi, you have a way with words. Hi there, this is Kyla calling you from Maryland. Hey, Kyla, welcome. What's up? I'm actually originally from British Columbia, and my husband is from upstate New York, which I think is relevant for this question. I often will say things like, you know, so-and-so thinks they're all that in a bag of chips or, you know, he's really not all that in a bag of chips. And my husband has no idea what I'm talking about. So I'm wondering where this comes from, and I'm assuming it's regional, but I'm wondering if you can tell me. So, yeah, this has been used since uh, the late 80s for sure, and it may go back a little earlier than that. And it's an extension of the older slangy expression, just plain old all that. Um, and this comes from Black American English. And just, again, like you used it, Kyla, was often used in uh, the negative. You ain't all that or you're not all that. Uh, and that might have been a shortening of all that great. And just mm-hmm. really a way to um, just kind of summarize just the everything that they are not. Just from top to bottom, from head to toe, you are not all that you think that you are. And then all that in a bag of chips was just a a fun way of extending that. And it really took off in the early 90s, very early 90s. In 1991, there was a Baltimore Sun story about new slang that was widely reprinted. I went coast to coast. And um, after that, the term was just everywhere. I think lots of people picked it up from there. Um, I'm not saying that the average person on the street, but certainly authors and people who are attentive to new language did. And interestingly, I can't find all that and a bag of chips in the lyrics of any hip hop song before that date. Although, you know, the lyrics websites don't have everything, but I did Mm -hmm. look. Um, But it's kind of like um, all that and the kitchen sink. It's kind of like throwing everything in there that's conceivable, you know? Right. Okay. Because I... I've, I've only ever heard that. And then once I was watching an English show, a British 
TV show recently, and they said that so and so thought he was all that in a plate of Ritz crackers. <laughs> I thought that that yeah. was completely amazing. <laughs> yeah, there are other people. People have played around with it a plate of fries, a plate of chips, a plate of green beans, a plate of biscuits and gravy. <laughs> They've done a variety of different things, but but usually all that in a bag of chips is the more common one. But yeah, it comes from Black American English and. And uh, like a lot of terms, uh, left uh, the speech of Black Americans and entered the mainstream uh, through the usual channels of, of, of popular culture. And um, it's a little dated now, just so you know. Um, and it's not oh. that used, but it's out there. <laughs> well, well, slang originally. is a way of, of coming back around, too. So maybe, yeah, who knows? Maybe much younger <laughs> people will start saying it. Thanks to you, Kyrie. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we're, I was going to say, maybe we're trendsetting right now. <laughs> As we speak. So, maybe. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> we are all that in a jumbo bag of chips. All right, thank you so much. That was very helpful. All right. Take care, Kyla. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Well, if your slang is new or your slang is old, we'd love to talk about it. 877-929-9673. Our team includes senior producer Stephanie Levine, engineer and editor Tim Felton, production assistant Rachel Elizabeth Weisler, and quiz guide John Chinesky. We'd love to hear from you no matter where you are in the world. Go to waywardradio.org slash contact. Subscribe to the podcast, hear hundreds of past episodes, and get the newsletter at waywardradio.org. Whenever you have a language story or question, our toll-free line is open in the U.S. and Canada, 1-877-929-9673. Or send your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. Special thanks to Michael Breslauer, Josh Eccles, Claire Grotting, Bruce Rogo, Rick Seidenworm, and Betty Willis. Thanks for listening. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. <laughs>